What's up, folks? This is RC Apologist, and we are doing a debate uh, between me and the Catholic Fusionist on the Immaculate Conception. And for those who don't want to get it mixed up in terms of the term, especially for those who are Black Hebrew Israelites or others, uh, this is dealing with the uh, issues of the doctrine of was Mary sinless and free from original sin. So um, this is going to be a formally moderated debate in terms of that we are going to be respectful in moderating ourselves since we are uh, well-known debaters within our communities and have enough respect and dignity to um, know and follow the rules of debate. So that being said, with how we're going to do this, we're going to have 15-minute opening statements uh, with uh, the Catholic fusion is starting first, and then we're going to go in the, that order. Um, then with 10-minute rebuttals, 10-minute cross-examination round, and then a five-minute closing statement. Um, so hopefully that, you know, y'all benefit and can gain much from this. So right now, and I'm going to keep present on, uh, on Max for the hope, probably for the remainder of this debate. And then who knows, we may take this to an audio format later, but uh, he'll have a timer so that way y'all can see, you know, how much time is going on within a specific individual. So presenting Catholic Fusionist, and whenever you're ready, you may begin. All right, let's get that stopwatch on and let's go. All right, I'd be, like to begin by thanking my interlocutor for having this discussion. The topic that's on the table is the sinlessness of the Virgin Mary, the mother of our Lord. The view from the few historically has taken two forms, the weaker form of the view, which claims that Mary was cleansed of both original and personal sin at her ensoulment, which was held by many like St. Thomas Aquinas before the doctrine was formalized later, and the stronger claim, which was that she was free from sin at her conception, thanks to the work of the blessed Duns Scotus. I will be defending the latter, but if my opponent wants to win this debate, he should refute the former as well, because... The sinlessness of Mary is not something that was always so well defined. But in any case, um, since the Reformation, the doctrine went by the wayside, although it was arguably held by Martin Luther, who used her holiness in a sarcastic insult to the Pope of all people. He said, then we sa shall sing the glad hymns to your hellishness, virgin, before and and after childbirthing. Since you are the pure Virgin Mary, who has not sinned and cannot sin for evermore. Now, some may downplay this, but remember, the point of the insult is meant to convey the following attitude. How dare you compare yourself to the sinlessness of the Virgin Mary? You're so full of ego, your hellishness. Um, if Bar Luther didn't believe that, then that uh, insult would kind of hold a little less weight, but... If uh, you ask me, I think if anyone knew how to insult somebody, it was Martin Luther, and I wouldn't want to take that away from him. Now, I don't want to get into that little area of the topic too much. After all, I would say Martin Luther was wrong about a lot of things, and since Protestants don't take him as inerrant, it's not something to give too much detail to in this debate anyway. The point is, whether he did or didn't hold to this view, I don't believe my opponent would question Martin Luther's salvation because of it if he found out it did. The point is, per the sort of salvific doctrines that Protestants hold, one can be a Protestant in good standing with his salvation if he were to accept my position. This isn't necessarily Catholic versus Protestant. This is more akin to whether or not uh, a more, the, uh, the more traditional view of the church, at least up until the Reformation, should hold on, or whether or not um, it doesn't hold up scrutiny. The fact is, salvation is, if the Protestant uh, cares, should not uh, really be affected one way or another. With that said, let's get to the argument at hand. First, my position is not the same, uh, is not some latter Catholic innovation, but has always been there since the beginning of the Church. In the work of On Grace and Nature, or Nature and Grace, St. Augustine states, he, Pelagius, enumerates that those who not only lived without sin, but are described as having led holy lives, Abel, Enoch, and also the mother of our Lord. For of her, he says, we must needs allow that her piety had no sin in it. We must accept the Holy Virgin Mary, concerning whom I wish to raise no question when it touches the subject of her sins, out of the honor of our Lord. Note that St. Augustine 
is arguing with Pelagius here. This is a man who doesn't think anyone was born of any sin. Now, if Augustine was to uh, give the Virgin Mary as an exception to the rule, then unless he has some reason, which is the historicity of this doctrine, I don't think Augustine in his uh, veracity would be doing so. Further, according to St. Ambrose of Milan's commentary on the Psalms, we read, Come then and search out your sheep, not through your servant or hired men, but do it yourself. Lift me up bodily and in the flesh, which is fallen in Adam. Lift me up, not from Sarah, but from Mary, a virgin not only undefiled, but a virgin whom grace had made involatile, free from every strain of sin. Lastly, we have uh, St. Ephraim of the Syrian, who wrote the following in a poem in homage to Christ. Thou and thy mother are alone in this. You are wholly beautiful in every respect. There is in thee, Lord, no stain, nor any spot in thy mother. Now, I could already tell that my brothers and sisters on the opposite side of the debate might roll their eyes, scoff, dismissing these inputs of the early fathers. This is fair, which is why I am merely using it as a defense. After all, if a doctrine lacks any historical grounding, we should reject it. I'm sure my opponent will probably bring up uh, some church father on the opposite side of the issue who probably said something to the contrary. Um, again, the point isn't to say that this verifies the doctrine. The point is to say that given we have such early testimony going to the uh, third, fourth century, we shouldn't be so quick to throw out the doctrine. It has historical veracity. But the ultimate um, litmus of doctrinal veracity is scripture itself. Now, I do grant that there's nowhere in scripture that explicitly says Mary is free from sin, both at conception and, and onward. However, there is a strong implication that she was sinless. And I'll, be, and I'll make some arguments for that from scripture. I think the strongest place is in Genesis 3.15. We read, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in the weight of, for her heel. The verse in question is challenged because the word she is also translated as it, that, or he. However, given that the term for her seed, Zara, is feminine as compared to Satan's, she, it, she seems like the most appropriate translation. If this seed was Christ, who was male, then I think that God in his holiness would have ascribed masculinity to the seed because, of course, um, the seed is supposed to be divine, he, male, not female. I, God would have ascribed more importance to the seed rather than that to which the seed belongs to. Furthermore, in Revelations 12, we read in, we read in uh, verses 1 and 2, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And being with child, she cried, traveling in birth, and was in pain to be delivered. It was the Virgin Mary who brought Christ into the world. She is the woman, and as a Jewish woman, she maintains the crown of twelve stars, with the sun and the moon, as in Genesis 37, 9 to 11, where uh, we saw, I believe it was Joseph who had the 12, the, who had uh, 12 stars bowing before him. Some might say that this woman of the apocalypse is Israel, the nation, or even the church. But given that revelations, Revelation is written at a time when the Jews betrayed Christ, I doubt that. There are some who interpreted the church as the woman, but it was Christ who brought us together, not the other way around. However, let's grant for the sake of argument that those interpretations um, are stronger than they appear. I'll even grant my opponent this. It doesn't rule all of them as being true, as the book of Revelation does allow for multiple readings of one symbol. This calls to mind um, one particular passage as proof. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the horror of Babylon is seated. They are also seven kings, Revelation 17, verses 9 through 10. Uh, here we see uh, seven heads representing two different things. I don't think it's impossible that those that, that verse represents the church, um, new Israel, old Israel, and of course the Virgin Mary. Since, of course, they're all of Jewish origin, 
and they all in some way bear relation to the to our Lord. However, going back to chapter 12, we read on, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell therein, woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, knowing that he hath but a short time. When the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he, persecuted, he uh, prosecuted the woman who brought forth the man-child, and there were given to the woman two wings of a great eagle, and she might fly into the desert unto her place, where she is nourished for a time, for time and times, and times a half, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out his mouth after the woman, water, as it were, river, that he might cause her to be carried away by the river. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up her mouth, and swallowed up the river, and the dragon cast out out of his mouth and the dragon was angry against the woman and went to make war with the rest of her seed who keeps the commandments of Christ of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ here the woman of the apocalypse is the hostile force used against satan and she uses her seed to make war against him she is who the prophesied uh, foretold it seems now god is using the woman as a way of fighting against satan not even just the woman, but her very existence. She is prophesied. She is foretold that her sole purpose is to bring God into the world so that the devil might be driven out. According to 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan is the god of the world. And according to Christ, if Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? In Matthew 12.26, <clears throat> Um, that's what we read. If Mary is to be, be a hostile force against Satan in her very existence, she must be separate from the influences of him in the world. Since Satan is responsible for the sin of the world, it follows she must be separate from all sin. To put the argument more syllogistically, premise one, that which cannot drive out Satan is not of Satan. Mary's whole existence is meant to drive out Satan. Therefore, Mary's existence is not of Satan. Um, from that, if we know something is sinful, it is of Satan. Of course, uh, he is the father of all lies. And since Mary's existence isn't sinful, and therefore, um, um, since Mary isn't of Satan, her existence isn't of Satan, it cannot be sinful. Um, because her existence is literally to go against all of Satan. Uh, all right, so how am I doing for time? 11 minutes? All right. Uh, I should probably go quickly. Uh, further in the passage within Revelations, we keep Mary. We read that Mary is kept away from the influence of the dragon, who is Satan. So this all gives a pretty good argument on its own. But let's go over a few others. How about her comparison to the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be this holy dwelling place of God, and we read in Scripture these following commonalities: Samuel. Uh, 2 Samuel 6, 9, And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? Luke 1, 43, And why is it this granted to me that the mother of the Lord should come to me? 2 Samuel 6, 14, And David danced before the Lord with all this meant with all his might, and David was gr um, grided with uh, linen, F and uh, David leaping and danced before the Lord. Luke 1, 44, for behold, the voice of the greeting came to my ears, that the babe in the womb leaped for joy. The baby being John the Baptist. Second Samuel 6, 10 to 11. So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Odabim, the Gettyite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of uh, Obedem, uh, the Gettyite, three months. Luke one thirty nine. Uh, verse and of course uh, Luke one fifty six. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste to the hill of the country to a city of Judea, and Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. The tabernacle is a pure sanctuary of God in the Old Testament. If Mary is the tabernacle of the New Testament, we would expect her womb to be holier and unpolluted, not less. So why would we expect any sin to be associated with her? Lastly, if we look at Luke one twenty eight. We read, the angel being come in said to her, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. If Mary is full of grace, she cannot have any sin, as it is grace, the unmerited favor of God that drives out sin. It is not a temporal event either. 
she is already filled with gr- uh, grace. It is titular, uh, just, uh, related to title, before she accepts her role in giving birth to Christ. The grammar is a passive middle voice. It represents a state in the past which has an effect on the present. Think of Paul's warning to us not to be conformed to the world in Romans 12 too. He's telling us not to act in a way which is already conformed to the world because to be conformed isn't just one act, it's a habit. It is further the only time in scripture the term is used, referring to no other human. While Stephen is referred to as full of grace and power, grace is adjectival in this case, speaking to how he is acting. We all act out of grace, it isn't a t- but it isn't a title to anyone except Mary. If Mary is full of grace, as a matter of title and position in the past, there is no room for sin. I give the rest of my time to my opponents. Okay, so I'll, I won't be using his timer. I already got myself a timer set, and everyone knows how I... If y'all seen the Godless Engineer debate that I had on the reliability of the New Testament, you'll know that with me and my timer seem to be pretty on match, especially with uh, the way that's been in sync with Shannon Q's timer. So that being said, I don't want to waste too much time on the of my time on the introduction uh, like this, but I will say at least, you know, thanks to uh, Catholic Fusionists for accepting, um, like I was doing like a little, you know, call out sort of saying that, you know, I rarely get Catholics to want to actually debate the times I've uh, called out on it. They usually refuse the times I've asked, but Catholic Fusionist is a guy I very much well respect, and I was much appreciated when I found out that I would be debating him because he is a guy I respect. He knows his information, and I have nothing but the utmost of respect. But that being said, we're going to be debating an issue that we still disagree on, and that is the Immaculate Conception. Now, again, as I mentioned, this is, we have to define our terms because there is some disagreements and misunderstandings. So concerning this uh, specific uh, doctrine, we're going to go to three sources to define it. The first being from Pope Pius IX in his uh, papal bull in which he says, quote, the most blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God, and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. And Catholic apologist Trent Horn uh, notes the com- this comment in his book, The Case for Catholicism. As it's defined, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception refers to, the Mary- to Mary being free from original sin or the deprivation of of sanctifying grace that man inherited uh, from Adam and Eve. And then finally, uh, Catholic scholar, or not Catholic scholar, Catholic apologist Peter J. Kreeft knows the following in Catholic Christianity, a book published by Ignatius Press. Non-Catholics and even Catholics often confuse the Immaculate Conception with the virgin birth, but the virgin birth refers to Christ being conceived in his mother's womb without sexual intercourse from a human father, while the Immaculate Conception refers to Mary being conceived in her mother Anna's womb without original sin. It is the world, not the church, that confuses sex with sin here. So those are some three uh, Catholic sources that help us define and understand what we're dealing with in terms of this debate today. (coughs) My point and my case... It's going to be argued that in order to refute this doctrine, we must examine it biblically and that as well as examine it historically uh, concerning the doctrine. First, let's examine and note that there is no explicit or biblical argument uh, that is made explicitly concerning the issue of Mary being sinless. In fact, even as Catholic scholar Ludwig Ott notes uh, in his book, uh, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, he says, quote, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary is not explicitly revealed in Scripture, and there are others that admit and say this, but the issue is not of an explicit mention, but rather of an implicit uh, mention, just like you don't have an explicit mention of the Trinity either. So there's a fair statement of something we would believe that's not explicitly taught in Scripture, but rather it's implicit. So we have to deal with implicit verses and see if they are actually teaching these things. So to conduct these uh my opponent went over uh a couple of these implicit statements and we shall try to go over them 
um, during the rebuttal time. But I do not believe that the verses of Genesis 3.15, for example, which I know is one he mentioned, uh, and especially of Luke 128, where it talks about uh, Hail Mary, uh, full of grace. I don't believe that this teaches her being uh, sinless or free from sin. So with the time, I'll at least show some verses and some reasons why she uh, can't be seen as sinless. So first of all, Based on the doctrine, they affirm Mary was sinless and she never sinned as a result, though there is a minority group that exists among Catholic apologists and scholars today that do affirm that Mary did in fact sin, but was simply born without a sinful nature. Um, the first thing I would like to say before we get on that is the issue, as was noted uh, by people like uh, Trent Horn and uh, Peter Kreeft, is that, you know, they believe that in the Mary, when Mary was in her mother's womb, she was uh, immaculately conceived that there was, she was free from original sin. And I don't know if this is the position of my opponent, but I've encountered this with others that have tried to use this saying that because of uh, Jesus being sinless, he can't have come from a human being that had original sin in order to get the, the sin-free nature. Um, so if this is the idea that my opponent wants to go with on that, I would suggest this, and of course he can respond to this in the rebuttal if he believes this or not, but I would suggest this regardless, that if that's going to be an argument, then why isn't Anna uh, considered, uh, why doesn't the logic go for Anna, who it would be the mother that bears forth uh, Mary? Because Mary, in order for her to be immaculately conceived and sin-free by that logic, since um, you know we need somewhere where it starts with Jesus, why not do the same with Anna? And then about that what about Anna's mother or father? Where does that logic go? I just want to point that out. Now, concerning this, uh, we'll note that Mary was definitely born with a sinful nature as she is of a human being and not the result of some special divine creation. As a result, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3 itself deals spe specifically in dealing with the fact that all human beings have this sinful nature and this original sin that causes that. Now, of course, there's probably an objection that will arise from this, but I'll save that for the uh, response. But I think that should be sufficient enough to point out that she is among the all of sin, sin, sinful beings um, and not Jesus um, being counted in those numbers. Now, Luke chapter 2, verse 48 through 49 tells us of Jesus' parents, especially Mary included, complaining and searching for Jesus, to which he responds with, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Now, if Jude chapter 1 verse 16 mentions that complaining against God is a sin and Jesus is God, then it must follow that it would be a sin to complain to Jesus at that point. And for that particular reason, with Mary, even though it was a per she was complaining like a parent, uh, was complaining to God, that is still one of the sins that is mentioned in Jude one sixteen, And she is complaining to God incarnate, to Jesus Christ, to his God manifested in the flesh, as John chapter 1 so proclaims. So we have these spe uh, specific verses. Another one that I would like to go over uh, briefly is Mark chapter 3. Um, concerning this, especially in verses 20 to 21, 31 to 32, and then 6, 4, what we're seeing is that a multitude and a group is there um, in which they're basically saying that Jesus is out of his mind, specifically, and this will be in the Holman Christian Standard Bible translation because that is one of my favorites. Then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they were not even able to eat when his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said he's out of his mind. And so that's what verse uh, 20 and 21 say. And then verse 31 to 32 is obviously the part where Jesus is, you know, saying that after being told that the family is looking for him, you know, where are they? These are, this is my family and such um, is the actual brethren that I have in Christ. And so the very fact, though, that they're saying that God is out of his mind. Now, that is certainly a sin, especially when you hear 
skeptics and atheists today say that God was out of his mind for causing a flood to go out. Just simply for saying that, again, is another act of complaining and shows where an act of sin um, is being done here. Now, in the context of Jesus being followed by a crowd who wants him to do miracles, Jesus was so preoccupied with them that he couldn't even eat due to this overwork, and his family said he was out of his mind. Now, concerning this, uh, scholars uh, note that verses 31 to 32, which mentioned Mary, is a backward resuming of verse 20 to 21, where Jesus' family calls him crazy. Thus, Mary is part of the group known as Jesus' relatives or family who called him crazy in verse 20 to 21. Now then, even if one is not totally convinced Mark is saying Mary believed, uh, along with the others, Jesus to be in, uh, insane, what is undisputable is that, as William L. Lane notes, quote, her presence with Jesus' brothers in chapter 3, verse 31, however, indicates that her faith was insufficient to resist the determination of her sons to restrain Jesus and bring him home. This is in the Gospel according to Mark, the English text with introduction, exposition, and notes, uh, published in 1974. Uh, Mary's faith being insufficient is a fault or sin. Faithfulness or having little faith or doubt um, is repeatedly condemned and looked down upon in Scripture, such as Second Chronicles 30, verse 7, uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 23, James chapter 1, verse 6, Matthew 14, verse 31, and various others. So there's the biblical case. Now the historical case. Now, I'm not going to say some church fathers, all the church fathers didn't believe this. Augustine obviously had affirmed uh, this specific position as well as a few others. But you can't say, like some people will say, especially in the Catholic Catechism, that the whole church... Um, at the, since the beginning, especially as Peter Kreeft um, states um, in his book of Catholic Christianity on the same page, the, but its substance had been known and believed from the beginning since it was present from the beginning in the original deposit of faith. So, and compares this to even as the Trinity and such being in the same way that it was recognized in the beginning. But if we look and examine uh, things, one thing to keep in mind is Catholic scholar Luigi Gambaro, in his book, Mary and the Fathers of the Church, The Blessed Virgin Mary in Patristic Thought, she says, or he says, the name of Mary rarely appears on the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. Now, while silence uh, does not mean, or the absence of evidence means, it's the evidence of absence, you still can't say, you know that this was in the beginning of the church conception, um, with lacking this uh, concept in, you know, Clement of Rome um, and all these other fathers. But to comment on one father particularly, uh, we have Irenaeus, um, who actually kind of viewed uh, Mary as having sinned um, in John chapter 2, verse 4. And in Against Heresies, book 3, chapter 16, here's what we read from Irenaeus. Quote, with him is nothing incomplete or out of due season. Just as with the Father, there is nothing incongruous, for all these things were foreknown by the Father, but the Son works them out at the proper time in perfect order and sequence. This was the reason why, when Mary was urging him on to perform the wonderful miracle of the wine, and was so desirous before the time to partake of the cup of emblematic significance, the Lord, checking her ultimate uh, un or checking her untimely haste, said, Woman, what have I done? What have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come, waiting for that hour which was foreknown by the Father. And to even comment on this specific uh, quote from Irenaeus, uh, patristic scholar uh, Philip Schaff, in his third volume of Church History, says that Irenaeus, quote, was still widely removed from the notion of the sinlessness of Mary and expresses and expressly uh, declares the answer of Christ in John chapter 2, verse 4, to be a reproof of her premature haste, or depending on some translations you have, untimely haste. So concerning uh, this issue, we've, I think I've made a case uh, within the opening statement, but we can expound on it more within the opening state, within the rebuttal rounds that we have. But here's what I would suggest, that while the thing has some historical merit in terms of later centuries, you then still have doubts that go on even once you have Igna uh, Augustine. You have people like, uh, according to some of the patristic scholars, John Chrysostom, um, 
Origen, and various others, whether they be later condemned as heretics or remain as saints and doctors of the church um, and such, that would deny and have doubts about the doctrine of the sinlessness of Mary. Um, so the issue then is not then going to just the tradition, but as even as uh, Chrysostom and others and Cyril of Jerusalem would uh, point out that the final authority on these matters should be considering scripture to test their words with scripture. And because we lack an ex any explicit as well as not even being able to reach an implicit uh, doctrine of this uh, definition of this doctrine in scripture uh, without contradicting the rest of the passages I mentioned, we must then conclude at this point that Mary was not sinless, but rather that she was a human being like everyone else, but she was given the role and was uh, given great favor in God's eyes to carry out uh, the mission of bearing forth the savior of the world. And with that, I end my time and head it on over to Catholic Fusionist. All right. Uh, can I make a remark that isn't a part of my uh, general time? Sure, briefly. Uh, okay, yeah, I just want to say, I am glad I based most of my speaking time around scripture rather than history for this case. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess all right and i'll begin all right so most of my opponent's arguments were from history which is kind of funny because it's usually the uh, catholic who is thought to appeal to history more often and the protestant who appeals to scripture more often but uh, i recognize he did make biblical claims and i do want to address them first let's go with of course the famous verse, all have sin. But does, ver but does the word all necessarily mean that it refers to every single person? Now, I know this might be odd, but um, maybe to appeal to my Calvinist inclination, um, my uh, Calvinist friends, or at least my friend here who is a Calvinist, um, does God desire all men be saved? And if he does, why do some men, uh, why are some men uh, predestined to damnation? Um, at least according to the doctrine of double predestination. I'm not sure if uh, R.C. Apologists holds to that view, but at the very least, there are some Calvinists who do. And on, now, um, St. Augustine and a few others who affirm some sort of doctrine of predestination would say that, um, even single predestination, all does not necessarily mean that there is no exceptions. Uh, for example, it is the case that um, all kinds of people might be saved. That's what First Timothy two four could be referring to. Like uh, he he refers to all kinds of men, like kings, peasants, uh, people of every race, etc. Not necessarily each and every individual person. Um, and that's why some men are predestined and some men are not. Even some men are even not only not predestined, but they're predestined to the opposite. So. I would uh, put that in there. In terms of Jude 1, verse 16, um, that's not necessarily to be said out of anger, but the verse itself in Luke says they said that out of astonishment. They were surprised. Not They weren't necessarily complaining. It wasn't out of anger. In terms of you know his family members referring to um, him being out of his mind, just because it refers to his family doesn't mean it refers to every individual family member. That would be a case of the fallacy of division. Next, we also have a certain church. Uh, we also have Thomas Aquinas who takes on some of these doubts. Um, he says, Origen um, and certain other doctors expound these words of Simon as referring to the sorrow which he suffered at the time of our Lord's passion. Ambrose says that the sword signifies Mary's prudence which she took note of heavenly mystery for the word of God is living and effectual and more piercing than any two edged sword. Others again, take the sword to signify doubt, but this is to be understood of the doubt, not of unbelief, but of wonder and discussion. Say, thus Basil says that the blessed Virgin while standing by the cross and observing every detail after the message of Gabriel and ineffable knowledge of the divine conception after the wondrous manifestations of miracles was troubled in mind. That is to say, on the one side of seeing him suffer in such humiliation, and on the other hand of considering his marvelous works. Likewise, likewise, um, they likewise, whenever somebody ex expresses a form of doubt, it could just be taken to mean um, doubt as in 
wonder. I can't believe this. Like, not necessarily a literal one, or uh, a literal notion of faithlessness. In terms of the history, I don't want to say too much about it, considering my op opponent is someone who is a proponent of sola fide, or sorry, sola scriptura. He he believes that scripture is the strong is the final authority, or at least the very strongest. So. If he's not taking the history too seriously, I don't want to push too much on that. Um, um, by the way, what was uh, the time schedule? Ten minutes or five minutes? Ten minutes. Oh, shoot. I really... <laughs> oh, man, this, is, this is actually a lot quicker than I thought it would be. Um, yeah, I do... Part of me wants to yield my time, but the other part... Uh, um, Okay, maybe I could address the Irenaeus claim because I'm not explicitly sure that he did deny it. At least I want to add a little bit of doubt. Um, he's uh, let's see. I'm trying. I'm trying to find the quote here. Um, con he says, um, uh, "In against all heresies, consequently, then Mary the Virgin is found to be obedient, saying, Behold, O Lord, your handmaid. Be it done to me according to your word.'" Eve, however, was disobedient, and when yet a virgin, she did not obey, having become disobedient, was made the cause of death for her and for the whole human race. So also Mary betrothed a man, but nevertheless a virgin, being obedient, was made the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. Thus the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosened by the obedience of Mary. What the virgin... Eve had bound in unbelief, the Virgin Mary loosed in faith. Here, Irenaeus is using virginity as the sign of her sinlessness. And since, of course, um, she was a perpetual virgin, um, despite being betrothed to a man, remained as such. Um, so, it seem, so it seems to me that if she did, was sinless and she remained sinless, and her virginity, sorry, if she was a virgin and remained a virgin, and her uh, obedience corresponds to that, it also would correspond that she never would have sinned herself. So that's at least a little bit of doubt in regards to that. And of course, even all these church, and even uh, the uh, RC apologists himself know that there were Catholic, a minority of Catholics who believe that it just refers to Mary having a sin nature, not necessarily um, that Mary uh, didn't sin. So it's possible that these church fathers could have granted that Mary sinned in some capacity, but that she just didn't have a sinful nature. And if that is a possibility, which I'm not saying it is or isn't, then you could, then it wouldn't rule out that in an early understanding of the doctrine, before it was fully developed and fleshed out by the church, that could have also have been permissible to hold on to. Um, again, even Thomas Aquinas didn't believe that she was immaculately conceived, but that she was immaculately ensouled. And so did a few other church fathers, I mean, uh, Patric uh, scholastic sources. So with that out of the way, I think that we've uh, covered the objections from scripture pretty well. And I think I've done my best to mitigate the counterexamples from history. And with that, I'll lend my time a little early. All right. Oh, and uh, set and start when you want. All right, I'll I'll take two of that if you don't mind. Two of my minutes, and I'll let you want me to stick with ten. Uh, can you stick to ten? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, <laughs> uh, do, I, 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 I'll uh, do nine if you want. <laughs> aim. How about this? How about you aim for ten, and gotcha. if you and if you're still in the middle of reading, I'll let you have two more. All right then. All okay. right, so let's go. Here we go. Um, so let's uh, deal with some of the claims that have been made. Um, I didn't get a chance to get all of the notes that were done, but I will at least go over as much of them as I can um, in regards to this. So now I like how my opponent uh, mentions the issue that, you know, concerning the all, we Calvinists also do a thing where we say, well, in some cases, does all mean all? Um, or does it mean a certain kind or a certain limitation or exceptions? To which I would say that this should also... Uh, after this debate and consideration, if Catholics are going to say this, then, hey, why not go a step further and do the same thing with election and come on over to the Calvinist side? Uh, we'll, 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 but that's too much to ask for at the moment. So let's just stick with the topic and deal with uh, the thing that, you know, if 
Christ, if he says all have sinned, then would that include Christ or is Christ an exception? And therefore, Mary can also be allowed as an exception to the rule. Now, however, the issue is that even in this uh, chapter, Christ being made as an exception is within the verse. <laughs> if we uh, look at this approach here, the problem is that it does not take into consideration that Paul excludes Jesus from the all have sinned group in verse 23. And he doesn't do the same concerning Mary. Because if you see right after verse 23, Paul represents Jesus as the unique solution to the problem of Mary's sin problem in verses 24 and 25, proving that he does not fall into this uh, global class of sinners by virtue of his uh, nature. Uh, hold up. So let go into Romans 3 to Job provide this context so it says of course uh all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god they are justified freely verse 24 by his grace through the redemption that is in christ jesus god presented him as a propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint god passed over the sins previously committed so we see that jesus is made as an exception in the very passage but do we see this going on with Mary? I don't think we see this going on at all concerning Mary. My opponent mentioned concerning Jude one sixteen, and then the comment of Mary in a uh, in the Gospels is that well that can't be considered uh, kind of because well it doesn't she wasn't um uh, it doesn't doesn't say she was angry or or that that that's the specific sin that's going on in Jude one sixteen is that it's some sort of uh, anger um, so. That wouldn't mean it. But here's the verse. And this is, again, in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Uh, funny how I'm probably going to get some hatred by the King James only camp uh, for this debate here. Um, but it says, these people are discontented grumblers, walking according to their desires. Their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. So the issue, even within the context that there are certain people that um, are condemned here under a context, even then... The sin that they're condemned for is not necessarily the context that they have, but also of the that the fact that that uh, thing that they did led them to commit these sins, being discontented grumblers, and that they utter arrogant words. Now, obviously, for this case, uh, we can agree, hopefully, that Mary was arrogant concerning why Jesus was, you know, having to be there and why they couldn't find him. Um, and so that's basically the point that Jesus then got, uh, was trying to respond to. Um, and so then discounted, discontented grumblers or her speaking arrogant words. This is what I'm referring to in what she did that uh, Jesus responded to by saying, don't you know that I'm supposed to be in my father's house? Now, my opponent mentioned Genesis 3.15, but here's the thing. Um, if you read the passage, it says he will crush the serpent, um, not she. And in fact, um, in the scholarly academia of this, when we have, for example, the updated Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew lexicon made by three scholars of Hebrew, that the word who uh, in the Hebrew means he. Uh, now, while there are variants that can mean she or it, concerning this specific instance, the Brown Driver Briggs set affirms that for this context, it is he and not she or it. Um, as the correct option for Genesis 3.15. This will definitely be found in page 215 of your 2010 edition of the Brown Driver uh, Briggs lexicon. Moreover, if we examine it uh, with Genesis 4.1, it shows that Eve anticipated a male and not female offspring that would crush the serpent's head. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. So a prophecy that gets uh, sort of emphasized there. This appears to be a positive exclamation indicating that Eve inferred the 315 promise of a future seed who destroys Satan was fulfilled with Cain's birth. Though incorrect about Cain, this does not help us know. 315 refers to a male offspring crushing uh, Satan's head, not a female. <laughs> so the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures were translated into uh, Greek in the 3rd or 2nd century B.C., and concerning the Septuagint translation uh, that is used, 
um, it it uses the Greek word autos, which means he, not ate, which means she. So even in the Septuagint, which is a translation that would have been familiar to Jesus and the disciples and the audience that he would have been speaking to, especially those of the Gentiles, um, he would have been using and referring to this, um, which includes he, not she. So the main problem that I've seen this happen with the Catholics is apparently that, you know, Pope Pius uh, the ninth, you know, erroneously thought that, you know, it is she because is using the translation of the Latin Vulgate from Jerome, who erroneously translated um, in the in the late fourth century, this word uh, to be, you know, ipsa, meaning she instead of a he. Um, and so this is where I believe the error occurs here. But here's the interesting thing to even note. Um, even Catholic uh, Bishop Alphonsus Liguori uh, from 1696 to 1787 commented on this problem prior to Pius IX's definition. He says in The Glories of Mary, uh, published in 1981, quote, she will crush your head. Some question refers, uh, some question uh, rather this refers to Mary and not rather to Jesus, since the Septuagint translates it, he shall crush your head. But in the Vulgate, which alone was approved by the Council of Trent, was fined uh, she. So the evidence shows uh, concerning this, that Genesis 3.15 means is God puts enmity between Satan and Eve, between Satan's seed and Eve's. Uh, so Jesus and Eve's offspring will crush Satan's head, and Satan will bruise Christ's heel. Mary is not the one who crushes Satan's head. This fact has been uh, conceded by uh, Rome for what we know. And for example, the Neo-Vulgate, the Nova Vulgata, translation of the Bible authorized by the Vatican in 1979, changed the feminine ipsa into the neuter ipsum, thereby correcting the Vulgate. Um, and in turn, P Pius IX, no longer uh, do you have, uh, she will crush his head. And even the Catholic Encyclopedia um, in volume seven, published in 1913, says, quote, the translation she of the Vulgate is interpretative. It originated after the fourth century and not can and cannot be defended critically. The conqueror from the conqueror from the seed of the woman who should crush the serpent's head is Christ. And this is from Joral, Charles George Hebermann, a Catholic who uh, makes comment on this. So in some, what we see about this uh, issue with Genesis 3.15 is that it cannot be defended from to say that Mary is involved here, but rather it's the seed um, of Mary, which it would have been the seed of Eve. And that is down the line. What we have is the issue of uh, Jesus Christ being the one who would crush the serpent and would crush the weight of sin. And we see this when we see the passage that he bore our sins on the cross and he canceled out the certificate of debt that was waged against us. Colossians chapter two, verse 14, for example. So, Concerning this, I think the case still remains that Jesus is the one that is going to be sinless as well as crush the serpent's head, while Mary was still born uh, with sin. But however, because she was found favor with God, not full of grace and sinless as Luke 128 uh, is misinterpreted by some people, but rather that she was found favor. And because the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, that's what caused Jesus to be sinless because it wasn't by a sexual reproduction in the natural human world, but rather it was strictly by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's work is able to do all things. We cannot be able to, we're not saying that we can limit the Holy Spirit. So is it possible for the Holy Spirit to immediately just give Mary uh, a child that is free from original sin and just immediately like that without sexual reproduction? Absolutely. And I think that's what we're dealing with. Mary not being sinless but rather that Jesus himself is sinless and for good reason. And with that, I end my time and uh, we begin cross-examination with uh, allowing me to get interrogated by uh, Catholic Jewishness for about 10 minutes. Okay. So uh, let's see. The, the first thing you said was um, you kind of made a typical Catholic response, which good on you. This is one I have used before, which was, well, Jesus was an exception made. There, well, when it comes to the verse, all have sinned. Therefore, there are exceptions. And you said the problem with that was um, Jesus is actually given as an exception within the verse, but Mary isn't. Is that correct? 
Yeah, I would say that uh, concerning the passage in its context that uh, there is an exception, but the issue is that Mary is not considered the exception. It's uh, Jesus that is based on verses 24 to 25 that, pro that shortly follow afterwards. Right. Okay. And um, my next point is um, the except having does showing that there is one exception necessarily negate that there are other exceptions note the term necessarily right i don't think it necessarily follows it because there's i think it's a uh, necessary that uh or not necessary that just because there's one that means there's others now there could be other exceptions but again we don't have to establish and see that uh that there is good evidence right. to affirm right. that others oh, okay right but that's what the whole debate is about whether or not mary was um, born sinless, and if she right. was, then she it would fall that she is an exception. Right, that she would be an exception. Right. Okay. So I think to invoke this verse before, uh, I think while this verse shows that there is a standard of or burden of proof that's put, in, that um, would you agree that this verse at best only shows, therefore, um, a face value proof. That is, it's up to me. It only shows that I have a burden of proof to show the doctrine. Not ne it doesn't necessarily negate the doctrine at hand. Uh, Repeat that again. Okay. Um, so then you would agree then that this verse doesn't show that there are no other exceptions. It merely shows that if there is an exception, mm -hmm. that person who is saying that there is an exception has a burden of proof. Yeah, I would say that there is a burden of proof to some degree, whether it be from a biblical or historical. Um, oh, okay. Oh, okay. That's my okay. That's my only point. I, my only point was that this verse doesn't uh, preclude my position. It only shows that I have a burden of proof to show my position. Uh, okay. So now let's just go on to Jude one sixteen. Um, you said that. So. My response was, uh, you kind of brought up that the verse shows about people being grumblers, being necessarily angry, but is there anywhere in Luke that says that Mary spoke to Christ out of anger as opposed to astonishment? Mm, I don't think that uh, there's anywhere that it says that Mary spoke out of anger or anything like that. I think that just simply, you know, regardless of whether she did or not, um, that, you know, it just simply said that, you know, she was trying to complaining that you know where was he um rather you have that in anger or where, anything where like it, that where does it say she complained well the issue is not saying the word that she complained is the words that she uh used in which she's basically using the language of a parent um when they just lost their kid and they've been trying to search all over and saying you know where have you been and all that and he says uh why do you ask why do you ask this question don't you know that i'm supposed to be in my father's house um is what right. Right, but, but the language seems pretty cold. It, it, it but uh, sorry, the written word is pretty cold by medium. It could you could also read it. Would you at least agree that you could also read it as saying um, she spoke out of surprise and Jesus was just responding in a maybe a, in a cheeky fa fashion? Mom, come on, don't you know mm -hmm. that I'm just going to ba go back to my father's house? Like right. more out of humor as opposed to you know him lecturing his mother. Well, I wouldn't say that he would be lecturing the mother. I would, I'll, I'll grant that. But even still, the statement that Mary did um, would be, you know, son, why have you treated us so? Uh, behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Even if she was just simply, you know, astonished and such, she's still out of astonishment. I've seen people today that still do that in astonishment. They will uh, complain and say things like that, which include phrases like, son, why have you treated us so? Uh, behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And of which this kind of responds in terms of, you know, uh, asking questions of God and demanding that he gives answers and such. Um, in Romans 9 says, you know, who are you, O oh man, to talk back or to, qu to question God? So I think we see consistently within the Bible, within Jude one sixteen and Romans 9, and see the same pattern happen in Luke chapter 2, verses 48 to 49. Uh, this pattern, even if Jesus wasn't explicitly rebuking or even rebuke it at all, the issue is still the fact that she still committed a act that is declared as a, a sin within the text of the Bible. Right, but isn't the problem with that sin uh, supposed to be that it is that, um, okay, actually, I should, what is a complaint? Maybe I should just start there. What is a complaint? Yeah, like, what would you say a complaint consists of? And you're referring to, like, in our terms, right? Like, in terms of the English language? Uh, 
just yeah, or just in terms of the context Jude is re referring to it as. Mm -hmm. Well, the way I would use it is as Merriam-Webster defines it is uh, to d to express grave pain or discontent and to make a formal accusation or charge, uh, being the two definitions from Merriam-Webster. Right, and is G and is she accusing him of uh, causing distress? She accusing of causing distress. Uh, I don't think she, there's uh, anywhere in the context. Fault, right. So she's not faulting him. Then how can this be a complaint? Well, that the issue was going to the second definition. The first one being to express grief, pain, or discontent, um, especially if pertaining to something. Is she saying why have you treated us so? And the, what she's referring to then is saying, "Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress." Uh, so she's basically saying that you know why have you treated us so? Uh, is the issue of being missing, like a child being missing and running off at a at a fair, which is something I did, and the parent is very worried and distressed and such. So that's why since some, why have you treated us so? Um, so this would be based on that definition of Merriam-Webster as a complaint. Right. So when the Bible says that God is responsible for something, like let's say the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, is he blameworthy for Pharaoh's actions? You say that again, you kind of broke up there. Oh, oh, my question is, is God guilty of hard when Pharaoh hardens his when God hardens the heart of Pharaoh <laughs> and Pharaoh uh, causes evil because of what God uh, caused, that is the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, from that does it follow that God is to blame for Pharaoh's actions? If God is to blame, no, it's, it doesn't follow that God is to blame for Pharaoh's oh, okay. actions. All right, all right. So just because Mary says that Jesus caused distress, does it therefore follow that he is to be blamed for his for their distress? No, it doesn't follow that he is to be oh. blamed for the distress, and that wasn't my argument. Right, and uh, does it follow that she is blaming him for his distress, for her distress? It would follow, yeah, that she's basically blaming uh for the distress, right. and that's why I think right. it would violate with Romans 9. Oh, all say. right, so I'll stop you right there then. If, uh, sh where does it say that he is at, where does it, uh, where in the verse does it say she is at fault, uh, she is laying fault at him for his distress, as opposed to um, showing a causal relationship? Like, he's missing, um, therefore, and that caused distress, as opposed to you went missing, Therefore, you are to blame for my distress. Could you repeat that again? Okay. Um, how are you getting that she is blaming Jesus for the distress of her and her husband, as opposed to her just describing a causal pattern? You went missing and you caused this distress. Mm -hmm. Well, concerning that, I would say it's in the context of the specific issue that's going on, and that is that in uh, verse 48, uh, it says that, you know, when the parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. This is in the Holman. Oh, okay. Um, so why were you searching for me? He asked them, didn't you know that I had to be in my house? The issue then is where it says that, you know, you treated us like this. And if you read the other, the earlier passages, it says after three days, meaning that it took three days that they find him in the temple complex sitting among the teachers. Um, so uh, Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem uh, during their return, and the parents did not know that he was uh, staying behind. Uh, All right. Assuming he was in a traveling party, they went on a day's journey, and then three days later, they eventually had to find him. I, okay, I've only gotten 30 seconds, so I'm just going to leave it there and give it to the audience to judge. Um, mm -hmm. The last one is, Grant, even if I am a minority view uh, regarding Genesis 3.15, um, how is it not possible that it is, but that uh, Mary, what Mary's whole existence is still set aside for the purpose of crushing the head of the serpent with Jesus? Like it does it not? Like her very existence is still to give birth to the Messiah, and he is to crush the head of the serpent. Right. Um. But I think that because of oh, uh, oh, sorry. I I think that's it. Uh, if you couldn't answer, um. Well, I'll at least I'll at least respond to it. Um. Fair enough. Um, and that is that I think that if you're referring to just, you know, why doesn't she get the credit um, even in that um, uh, period, then 
I mean, I mean, the issue is that it says that he's going to crush it. it doesn't mean that automatically that she as a result uh, will. And I think that's as was noted earlier with uh, them and the new Vulgate and the Neo Vulgate Vulgata um, that they translated in a neutral sense to try to get that. Um, I don't think it follows because again, the original language states that it's he that's going to do it. And if you want to argue that, you know, um, because you know Christ is the seed of the woman, then that means she also participates in that. Um, that doesn't uh, follow, and I think that it's going to be stretching and lead to a lot of uh, errors, um, not just within that specific area, but elsewhere in Scripture. In terms of, you know, when people saying uh, God uh, commanded these people to go out and kill, uh, say the Amalekites and whatnot, even if. Uh, the issue is that these people were the one that were engaging in the warfare. It would, that would mean that because God's the one that ordered it, that means he uh, was the one that did the killing um, as well, rather than uh, commanding it and ordering it to be done by his uh, chosen people. Right. So. Oh, okay. Um, cool. And uh, I don't think I could go any further. And I guess it's your time to start the question. So uh, tell me when you're ready. we Will do. All right. Here we go. So question number one, do you affirm that the Bible explicitly states the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception? Explicitly? No. Okay. Just want to make that sure. Uh, when would you say is the first time that it's really um, in church history um, proclaimed um, and, def and defined explicitly out of all you can find in there? Well, um, it, the earliest, if that verse I quoted from Irenaeus is anything to go off of. Um, it would probably be there, but even still, Mary, even still, um, we have uh, St. Ephraim the Syrian, we have uh, St. Ambrose of Milan, we have St. Augustine of Hippo, who all seem to um, show this, uh, to have some semblance of the doctrine. St. Ephraim the Syrian is the earliest one um, I quoted for this debate, but there could be others that I'm neglecting. It should also be noted that um, these are, I didn't put too much stock into looking through history to begin with because mm -hmm. I wanted this mostly to be script, uh, scripturally based, mostly okay. because I wanted to win over my Protestant uh, brothers on the other side. All right, that's fair enough. <coughs> um, so concerning that, um, let's go then to a verse. Do you think that Luke one twenty eight uh, affirms the, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception? Um, yes, it would kind of entail that. Okay, and you would get it because of the phrase that's used in some translations, uh, full of grace? Correct. Do you believe that's an accurate translation of the Greek word? As opposed, if, yes, it's synonymous with highly favored one. What does grace but mean but keratos? Keratos means favor. If she is full of grace, if she is highly favored, then it follow, then the definition should be synonymous, at least as they're both understood now and then. Mm -hmm. All right. So concerning this particular thing, have how do you just base that off of the translation or are there any scholarly or academic um, works that you uh, suggest would give this uh, approach in terms of the interpretation? Um, I couldn't suggest a scholarly source mostly because when I wanted to look into the verse, I translated, I looked at the word as best as I could. I didn't want... Uh, if you, the way I see it is, I don't really want to play a game of my translator can beat up your translator. Right. I just want it. I just want to do my best to find the best translation I can do. Mm -hmm. So then, regarding translations, then would you at least consider just the that besides just English translations, the issue of uh, scholars and lexical and uh, word dictionaries within that examine this specific uh, Greek term. I, I don't understand the question. Would you, ex uh, concerning the term that is used, the uh, uh, karato and such that is used, uh, would you consider lexical sources rather than translation sources as something that's to be um, reliable and helpful in understanding the meaning of the uh, word? Oh yeah, I, th I think that lexical. I think all those sources are reliable. I just my only point was I want to take the basic tools and building blocks and work through the translation myself. Gotcha. Uh, right. So concerning this, uh, are you familiar with Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary? I've heard of it. I. Um, but um, yeah, what about it? 
Well, in its a uh, academ academic approach in defining uh, Kelato in under the English uh, entry of favor and favored, where it listed as a verb, um, it says the following quote: "Akin to a, which was car charis, um, to endow with charis, primarily signified to make graceful or gracious, and came to denote in Hellenistic Greek to cause to find favor." And this example is given as Luke uh, 128, highly favored. Um, and then it says the same thing is found in the same exact context as Ephesians 1.6, um, which is referring to believers and is translated made accepted. Um, further stating that it does not mean to endue with grace. Grace implies more than favor. Grace is a free gift. Favor may be deserved or gained. Um, would you agree with that definition? Uh, could you cite me the particular passage again? You said Ephesians what? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, where according to Vines, and I don't know which tra translation they're going off. Oh, it says King James. Um, Ephesians they, chapter 6, verses? No, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Oh, I see. Ephesians 1, 6. Yeah, and in the King James it said made accepted, but others like the RV says freely bestowed. Hmm. Right. In the... Com Okay, I, I suppose I just need to read the uh, Greek in which it's based off of, but I know for a fact that the term that the title or the use of the term "highly favored one" as it's exposed in uh, Greek is only applied to Mary. Like mm -hmm. she's kind of set aside. Uh, the term uh, in Ephesians uh, one six is "ephion doxos" uh, to the praise of the glory, and then you have. Of the, um, of the of grace, uh, tes keratos of him, which is which he has freely given in us and in the beloved one. So, um, so here we don't have keratos as being a matter of degree. We only have keratos being a matter of kind. So when it says highly favored one of Mary, it's not just saying that she has grace. Of course she has grace. Um, but the title is she has she is full of grace or she is the highest of those who are favored mm -hmm. or being highly favored. Uh, that's what I'm specifying to. Okay. Then. Uh, usually. Um, yeah. So that's, um, so that's usually what I'm getting at. All right. So concerning this uh, to, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that uh, Jimmy Akins is a, is a favorite of yours in terms of Catholic apologetics. He's all right. I mean, in ter I mean, in terms of Catholic apologists, I usually tend to deal with um, not more natural theology. All right, that's understandable. Okay, so um, in a article that was uh, written for, or in terms of actually, it was something he said on the Catholic Answers uh, at one point. Um, James Aiken mentions quote, and it's and so it's the Immaculate Conception, something that is consistent with and coheres with the use of the word ketonomy there, but it's not something that the word ketonomy uh, requires. This is a Greek term that you could use in the exact uh, grammatical formation for someone else who wasn't immaculately conceived. Would you agree with the statement from James Aiken here? I think he grants too much. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't grant that. Uh, I don't like if J if James wants to grant that himself, I see no reason why I should. I'd have to look into his claim, just out of prudence, if you understand. All right. I'll, I'll send you that link in case you want to check that out from his words and then do uh, some research on that. Um, so... I'm sure there was a... I forgot where the other uh, text I had gone to that deals with the specific issue of the uh, word is used. But there is actually, though the Brown Driver Briggs disagrees with the translation here, but there are some that try to make a case for this. Um, so to go to the Apocrypha, are you familiar with the uh, Sirach? The book I'm, not, of Sirach? I'm, familiar, I'm familiar with the book of Sirach, but I don't think it's in the Apocrypha. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but concerning uh, that... Um, when it, when it, in the Septuagint, it uses the Greek word um, that is the same thing uh, that is used in Luke chapter 1, verse 28. But it uh, says, you know, low is not a word better than a gift, but both are with a uh, gracious man. The term gracious there is one that is described as what 
Mary is called the the highly favored, would you consider that in that case in uh, Sirach, or as others have said, Ecclesiasticus, that that's uh, referring to someone that would be sinless because it uses the term uh, Karakonomy? No, no, for two reasons. The first is if it was the same term, then it would have been highly gracious or fu fully gracious. Uh, I don't think it is translated as such, and I'm kind of skeptical why it isn't. The second problem would be um, he's speaking only about uh, gracious in terms of, you know, natural relations, human goodness, uh, human graciousness. When God puts Mary as uh, the mother of God, he's speaking about grace in the context of the economy of salvation, which is two very different contexts. Okay. So, so you wouldn't say that with the terms of the found favor or full of grace, that this is just simply referring to that God found favor in Mary, who is, while being a, a lowly social position, um, she's found high favor and position with God, especially to being the one to bear uh, uh, the, the Savior. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that um, for the reasons I outlined earlier. I think you would say that Moses was given a kind of grace when God made him a prophet. However, he didn't have salvific grace because Moses wasn't saved and brought into heaven until after the atonement. Uh, there are multiple kinds and understandings of grace and what you're given favor to. But Mary, but the grace Mary was given was in the context of the salva economy of salvation. She actually has a role in bringing forth Christ, which even Protestants recognize when they say that she was blessed with the privilege of giving birth to the Messiah. That, mm -hmm. that blessing and favor res is related to salvation, not, m not merely um, doing God's work on earth for earthly purposes. Okay, um, that's is that good? Yeah, that's good. So, closing statements uh, whenever you're ready. All right. So, I again, I'd like to thank my opponents. Um, we discussed quite a few things, and I'm still not, and I'll go with why I'm not convinced of my opponent's arguments. Um, just, just to go over it again, um, just because. I'll it says I'll have sinned does not necessarily mean that there are no exceptions to the rule. Uh, Mary can be an exception. My opponent and I just disagree on whether she was or wasn't an exception to that rule, invoking that um, ahead of time as saying that there's no exception but Christ and Christ alone seems to me to uh, beg the question. Calvinists themselves all agree that not all men um, that God doesn't desire all men to be saved. At least they have some way of reconciling the verse with their doctrine, and I think it would behoove them for consistency to extend that to us Catholics. Um, and on the reverse, I think we Catholics should be more virulent on when we use that to oppose uh, Calvinists, just out of fairness. I'm not con again, I am also not convinced that Mary said what she said um, as a complaint, I don't think when she said that she said it out of uh, out of a way of signifying doubt or signifying complaint. I think she was honestly surprised with the whole event. I think when she said that to Christ, she was only she was speaking about it because she was astonished at the whole thing, not because she was um, laying fault at his feet for doing this. I think she would recognize that he can do what he does because he is God. But at the same time, merely asking for an explanation out of astonishment does not constitute a complaint in my book. And any more, even if God is at the cause of it, it doesn't follow as with Pharaoh that God is responsible for some kind of wrongdoing. Now as to Genesis uh, chapter 3, I'm granting that I am going to be minority, but in terms of my own viewpoint, um, oh shoot! Um, how am I doing for time? Because I forgot to start it. Uh, I, I I forgot to even count a timer for that. Well, I thought you started it, but oh, um, how about we count that? How about we count that as two minutes? And, okay. uh, give, and all right, cool. Uh, so three minutes, and I'll count on you to say stop. The we okay. Um, next, okay. Uh, furthermore, when it comes to uh, Gen Genesis three, I grant I'm the minority viewpoint view. 
but it also but even if we were to grant that it was a him who was the seed my argument still maintains it a strong um, my argument doesn't really follow any weaknesses after all mary is still predestined to be brought up for the sake of bringing forward the seed who is christ and having him bring down satan the the woman is still prophesized in revelations chapter 12 as doing this that's what her very existence was at least according to john um and it says um and the dragon was angry against the woman and went to make war with the rest of her seed who kept the commandments of god and have the testimony of christ so mary is so at this verse mary and eve can be two parts of the same woman they could both bring forward the seed who is Christ. The old Eve, of course, disobeys, whereas she as the new Eve does obey. And it is, her, and because she is the seed that kept the commandment of God, and that, that she would be thus responsible for um, um, being part of Satan's downfall. And because Satan, that is not which of, and because Satan cannot drive out Satan, she must be kept apart from Satan in doing so and in obeying, unlike Eve who disobeys. All right. Um, next. And uh, what else is there? I should also bring out that my opponent had never once addressed the comparison of Mary to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant has the properties of being in of being pure. They It has the properties of being holy. Now, I'm not saying that you couldn't touch Mary out on the street if you didn't want to. I'm speaking about her properties in the womb, not necessarily her properties as a whole person. But it would follow that if there was some impurity about Mary, it, including her bi body and her biology, you know, because we get sin is, co is uh, compared to a lot of, of the time of being of the flesh, then she would have to be kept pure. Otherwise, we'd have to say that the Ark of the Old Covenant and the Old Covenant itself has something which is superior to that of the New Covenants, which I think would be um, something no Christian would want to affirm. And the various verses I've given to show that parallel should be given heed. I think that's the strongest argument, and it's not one my opponent has addressed. And with that, I'll end my conclusion. All right. I will then make my five minute closing statements. And as such, um, that I'm again thanking uh, opponent for accepting the debate and having this. Um, so I, I think we've covered a wide variety concerning the issues and the topics that we've dealt with. Of course, I didn't get to do, discuss the issue of the um, the arc. Um, I probably missed I missed that during the uh, opening statements, but I will say at least concerning something that a. Uh, uh, that there are some scholars that even as Catholics, um, like Dr. Raymond Brown and Joseph Fitzmaier in their books, uh, you know, Mary in the New Testament, among other works, uh, that while they can see people have made, trying to make this, they don't, them as Catholics don't agree and come to these uh, same conclusions. So, I mean, I will do my best to examine and search for these uh, uh, specific passages. But however, the issue that I want to deal with in my closing statements is this. That of all that you've heard, I hope you consider the case that, one, it has been even admitted by my opponent, there is no explicit uh, declaration of this in Scripture. So that's why um, if we're going to deal with this, it must be from an implicit recogn recognition. And even from that, we went over at least two verses, Luke chapter 1, verse 28, and Genesis 3, 15. I, can, I challenge anyone to do a study of these and... What I will guarantee is that for most of this, if you don't allow your tradition to control you and your um, examination of these verses and you do um, your work in examining the scholarly world and the scholarly peer-reviewed papers in the academia as well as even the commentary uh, itself that you can find on these specific uh, books of the Bible, um, you'll have uh, you'll come to the same conclusion with me that this is not proclaimed that immaculate conception or that Mary was sinless and free from sin. Um, that is something that I strongly have confidence in. Now I could be wrong on how some people may come to the conclusion, but out of a majority, I would say that a majority would come to the same conclusion that I come at 
if you don't put any of the tradition, rather be the tradition that I have or the tradition uh, that my opponent has, that you would come to the conclusion that we, uh, that I am established in the debate. But that being said, that what is at stake? Why is this such an important issue concerning Mary being sinless or not? And it's this, because one, you have the issue of Mary. Mary is uh, the one who gives birth to the Savior, and she, uh, being given the same kind of uh, attributes, if you will, of that Jesus Christ, who is God manifested in the flesh, has, especially with terms of sinlessness, among other doctrines, I believe that this um, elevates Mary to the point where I will just say what I believe, that this results in some form that can lead to a form of accidental Mary worship um, and raising her to a goddess. Um, now, do I say that Catholics are indeed worshiping her? No, I do not say that they're intentionally are doing that at all. Um, but some could fall into that risk. Um, and that is why I am suggesting uh, that if we just examine the Bible and examine these verses um, and testing that uh, and testing the church fathers and others with scripture as they would so uh, among people like Cyril of Jerusalem and others would advise, advise us to do so, we would come to the conclusion that Mary was not sinless um, or uh, born without uh, the stains of original sin as Pope Pius IX had stated, but rather that we would get that she was a sinful human being like all others, but this does not nullify or degrade her, but rather that she was still found highly favored with God into the fact that a, pers a person like her of a low social status uh, was given such an honor, such a benefit to be able to give birth to the Savior of those uh, who have sinned. And so that when he came to the cross, Jesus Christ, being the one who would crush the serpent's head, when he came to the cross, died on the cross, shed his blood as an atonement for the sins of sinners, so that in him we find salvation and redemption, including that of Mary, um, as a result. And so I think that if Mary was alive today, she would recognize and tell us this um, uh, for that. But of course, that's just me and my understanding. I'm sure my opponent will have a different understanding, uh, different interpretation. But hey, that's why we're having this debate. Not so that at the end we can say we are right and we're wrong, but rather that you, the audience, can decide based on uh, the the issue um, and examine the evidence and you come to the conclusions yourselves uh, for this. Uh, so that being said, uh, this has been the, uh, the debate. So um, what do you think you did best and what did you think you did worst? Like what could you have worked on better and what you could have, uh, uh, what do you think you just nailed? Well, I think that you know I could have uh, learned more from the issue of uh, studied more because there were there is concerning the research that I was getting into, there was an article that I looked at and saw that was dealing with Mary being the Ark and such that would deal with the whole thing extensively, um, but I apparently had missed that and would didn't consider that that was part of the issue of the topic, especially when I was examining um, the works of Trent Horn in the case for Catholicism and when I was looking over at a. Peter Kreef's uh, Catholic Christianity book um, the other day at Books a Million. So uh, I think that would be, you know, kind of where I made a mistake there is that there were some things I wasn't too prepared for, which was specifically that. But otherwise, I think I did pretty fine. Uh, yeah, actually, I would say you did a good job. Um, my tip to you would be um, usually the best people you debate against aren't going to be people who repeat the same talking points as other apologists. So you always have to be prepared. Um, but I I think another thing you did well was citing other Catholics because that's something like if I'm going to say well, my weakness, I should have I should have done my part in due diligence to bring in other Protestant theologians and scholars. Um, I think that's my one weakness, but I think a strength I did was sticking to Scripture, mostly for uh, this debate because I think that Protestants uh, are like. Part of my dealing with Protestants is you guys, if I was to cite history and do it well, I always feel that even if they granted me that, they could always lean back on just scripture alone and their specific passages as a trump. So I always feel that history, while nice, needs to, oh, when discussing with Protestants, needs to take a back seat in for the purposes of convincibility.
Mm -hmm. I do want to ask this, that since you did mention that, uh, when I've had, there's, like I said, there's people I've tried asking for to come to this uh, discussion or debate on these kinds of issues. Um, and at one point when I would try to go into the Catholic scholars, they kept claiming that I'm quoting them out of context. Um, and that not, that if I were to keep reading, it would actually, you know, refute and contradict what I believe they're saying. Do you believe that that's what I was doing at all? I have no reason to believe that's what you're doing. It, I granted it, you could be doing that, but I have no reason to believe that's what you were doing. All right. That's understandable. All right. So All right. Uh, if, as, as a Catholic and we're, you know, we're criticizing each other's views. Do you feel like there was any disrespect uh, towards some of the, especially towards the last uh, closing statement that I said, or like, what are your thoughts were on that in terms of conduct? No, I thought, no, I thought you were really respectable. All right. And okay, and uh, how did you? Th and actually, just to get some reflection on you, what do you think were my strengths and uh, weaknesses? Um, for your strengths and weaknesses, I think that the fact that you know you, like you like you pointed out with me that you know I stick to, I try to use Catholic scholars as well as even some of the history to deal with the issue with the my Catholic friends. Um, uh, you tried to do yourself a sola scriptura uh, aspect. Um, in approaching this, which um, I think shows a, a an idea of using uh, what I've always uh, asked for people is using like a consistency or even scale kind of thing. Like I will do the same thing when I deal with the the Muslim op um, op opponents and apologists is that I go to the Quran, the scholars, the Hadith, um, and the Tafsirs um, that help boil down what specific verses or hadith mean as well as uh, essential doctrines of islam and such um last night we actually showed a quote from a muslim scholar that showed a sort of binitarian um uh, view where allah has a face um but they while saying that he has a face they don't they still don't liken him to his creatures um, as a result and this was a majority view in uh egypt uh syria Lebanon and all that during that time that this specific scholar was alive um, during a, a time of Islam. So I, you know, things like that, I think is important that we use uh, consistent consistency and using our opponents uh, standards against them, especially in terms of using their own means of doing of engaging in apologetics, especially in you using solo scriptura against solo scripturists and me going to some of the tradition as well as pointing out Catholic scholars uh, in terms of you. Hmm. All right. So, okay, that's fair enough. Um, now, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of understanding the sinlessness of Mary, that's what you kind of uh, when you sold me on this debate. I wasn't sure if it was on the immaculate conception necessarily, because there were people who believed Mary was sinless, but she wasn't immaculately conceived. Likewise, there were scholars who believe that she just had a sinless nature but doesn't mean she didn't sin right. um right how did uh, i understood it to just me be a blanket wide open discussion on what that could mean rather than just getting specifically into catholic doctrine uh, did you just take it as being the immaculate conception and her sinlessness onward i took the issue being that you know it's about the immaculate conception and her sinlessness as a result of that because there are people that say that you know like pope pius and trent horn and uh peter kreef that you know that she would be sinless um but i think as uh kreef notes that you know there are people that would uh affirm that she was a, uh hold up well it's raining no wonder they're um, hearing things um but yeah, I would affirm that, yeah, I think that, you know, there's differences and distinctions to make. But I think that what I was trying to deal with um, specifically um, was the doctrine of just, you know, her being sinless uh, that some people proclaim, but mostly the Immaculate Conception as a result. I see. All right. And uh, let's see, how did you, what was my best scriptural support and what was my worst scriptural support? Oh, good question. Um, I think that your uh, your best uh, scriptural support that you uh, tried bringing to the table was Genesis. Uh, well, 
I think concerning that I would say Genesis three fifteen since that's the main one that I uh, heard and dealt with. Um, because some people can try to say, especially if we uh, go to the, uh, I don't know if, if out of the different translations you prefer the the, the Vulgate or the Neo Volga Neo Vulgata um, in terms of uh, which you would prefer to use in terms of uh, traditional uh, Catholic uh, mm -hmm. standard. Um, but I would say that you know. Uh, Genesis three fifteen would probably been the one that you used that I would have said was your best shot. Mm -hmm. So, I see. And um, all right, cool. And which one was? And uh, by and conversely, you would say that Luke uh, chapter one verses one twenty eight would be the weaker one. Which one? Yeah, um, I think that, yeah, that, well, that would. Yeah, I think that would be a bit of a, a weaker. Uh, one in my opinion. I see. Okay, that's fair. Um, I think you, on the converse, I think your strongest was actually um, um, the complaint at the temple, but I think your weakest was um, citing the, the passage, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I, I think that uh, your Calvinism kind of... I think if you were an Armenian, that verse would have been stronger. Uh, yeah. Because... In, an Armenian uh, doesn't uh, believes that both that verse and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, God desires all men to be saved. He would say that no, no, both are you know fully encapsulating. But um, I guess that's not worth sacrificing your Calvinism for. Well, I think there would be something that I think, as I tried to mention, that there is a distinction we uh, try to make, and that is that the context would help identify uh, when an all means an all, and when a certain kind means a certain uh, kind and what the distinctions are. And I think it depends on the context. And I think that's where Romans uh, 3 verses uh, 24, 25 help fill in that context for uh, for us. So that I think that as long as we do that, then it would definitely be consistent. Otherwise, um, if they just use that alone uh, without trying to go anywhere else, I think that that will definitely be the Calvinist apologist's uh, downfall. Okay, fair enough. All right. And... Uh... Yeah, okay. I'm, I think I'm good on the discussion, unless you want anything to add. Um, none that I can think of. All right. Um, cool. Um, if you, this debate was uh, pretty fun, and uh, thanks again for hosting. Hey, no problem. And for all those who are watching, hope you benefited and learned from this. Uh, 